everyone and welcome back. Today I am going to be diving in to the complex world of textiles, starting with silks. Now there are so many different silks out there in the world, and we are going to focus on some of the more popular ones when it comes to modern day. The things that you will regularly find for sale and may have questions about how do you actually define what that fabric is? How does it feel? How does it handle? Where should I use it? Where is it appropriate or not appropriate historically? Now, I do have to specify most of what I'm going to say historically is going to be based in European markets because I don't have the knowledge base of silk when it comes to the history in Asia. That goes so much further back than my knowledge does in any way. They had finely woven impressive silks so far back, and my knowledge really only extends back to about 14th century Europe, so there are going to be plenty of examples that go further back in Europe than that, and far further back in other areas of the world. But first, let's go ahead and start with some really basic definitions and concepts that you'll need to understand in order for me to explain what the different types of silks actually are. In its base form, silk is a fiber, meaning that it can be in so many multitudes of weaves and uses, but in its raw state, it is a fiber, meaning in this case that it actually comes from a silkworm. It is spun into a cocoon. Now, this means that silk is one of the only natural fibers that is a filament thread. This is defined as something that is incredibly long, and more often than not, filaments are man-made fibers. They're extruded from machines in very long sections. You compare this to staple fibers like cotton or wool, where they are very short, and therefore you end up with very often a more fuzzy fabric, unless you go through specific methods to smooth the thread down or smooth the fabric down afterwards. Silk, on the other hand, is very long, very glossy, and has a lot of shine to it, which is one of the main factors in silk being such a popular fabric. And it does also mean that it is fairly expensive because the actual process of harvesting silk from silkworms and getting the entire thing processed is rather complicated and very hands-on. So it is expensive and has always been for a reason. That doesn't mean that all silks are incredibly expensive. It means that there's a range, just that that range tends to trend a little towards the higher side. Next, we're going to take that fiber and start processing it it gets turned into threads. Depending on whether we're talking about sewing threads or weaving threads, they are different. They have different spins to them. They need to have different twists depending on what purpose they are for. Because a sewing thread is going through fabric repeatedly, it's going through a lot of friction. It needs to be able to hold up to that. Whereas a thread meant for weaving may have very little actual friction and can be much more flat spun or can be spun a little bit less smooth. It doesn't need necessarily as many ply, meaning that you can twist one fiber rather than having to twist multiple fibers together. So a lot of threads may be multiple plies where you've twisted a few strands together and then you twist those twisted strands back together into a bigger bundle and that makes it very strong and very durable. You don't necessarily need to do that for your fabric. It's not that they never do. It's just not necessary in the same way. So that's a simple reason why you can't just pull silk threads out of your fabric and use them for sewing. They'll break. They're just too fragile for that in most cases. Once we have our threads, sometimes they go through processing like dyeing before they are actually woven into textiles. You have thread dyed fabrics, which are different from printed or fabrics that are dyed at the very end. Once those threads are processed, they are then set up in a loom. So the warp, which is the very long length of the fabric, is set up first with lots of pretty little parallel lines of threads. And then from there, you send a shuttle back and forth, and those warp threads go up and down to create different weaves and different patterns as the weft thread goes left to right and back and forth. So depending on how those threads are lifted or lowered, you get different patterns, different weaves, and different textiles. The size of the thread can also make a difference in what type of textile we're dealing with, as well as how closely they are woven together. Some textiles are very, very finely woven and dense, others are very loose and open weave. So we're going to see a whole range for that. 
So then we take the fabric off the loom, and at that point finishing occurs. It may be dyeing or printing. It may also include things like adding a stiffener or some sort of starch to the textile in order to keep it very stiff and structured. There's a whole load of different types of finishing for every different type of fabric. We're not gonna necessarily talk about that as much today because silk doesn't go through as many distinctive finishing processes as some of the other natural fibers do, but it is important to know that sometimes this finishing is not washable. And that is one of the things that is really essential to understand about silk, it is not often washable without changing its entire texture and appearance. There are some silks that can be washed. They have much softer texture. They don't tend to have a lot of sheen to begin with and they are not very stiff. Those can hold up to washing differently than say a very stiff, crisp silk, which will probably lose all of its sizing and become much more soft and very often wrinkly as well. So it is something to be aware of if you're planning on dyeing or washing your silks. Some will hold up to that and some will not. So with that, let's dive in to our first silk. Silk taffeta is one of the most popular silks within the historic costuming community for good reason. It is a very effective fabric. It has a very good body to it. It is very stiff and it is very crisp. It is usually fairly lightweight, though it can range from very lightweight to a mid heavy. You have the lighter weight ones, which sometimes have specific names like lustring, but taffeta is sort of the general term. Taffeta is specifically defined by the fact that it is a plain weave, meaning that it is simply over, under, over, under, over, under. It has nothing fancy going on on top, and its luster comes from the fact that it is a silk fiber. You will also see some specialty versions of taffeta done where they are called iridescent or changeable. And this is a very simple process of having your warp threads be a different color than your weft threads. That's all it is. And it creates a very iridescent appearance to the fabric where as it moves and folds up, you will see different colors in different areas. And it is particularly favored for things that are pleated and textured and gathered up where you get a lot of different angles on the silk and therefore a lot of different colors. So it's a very beautiful option for silk taffeta, but plain weaves can be wonderful as well. And they are useful for so many different things. You see taffeta being used in just about any garment, it seems, throughout hundreds and hundreds of years. On top of that, it is sort of a middle-priced silk. It's not incredibly cheap, but it is also not incredibly expensive, and it is something that is very easily found today in a multitude of colors, and you can find in many historic garments easily in multitudes of colors as well. So it's a very, very versatile fabric. Closely related to silk taffeta, we have Dupioni, Dupion, or Shantung. Shantung tends to have a little bit less texture than Dupioni does. They are very similar in the fact that they are very taffeta-like in their texture being stiff and lighter weight. However, they are full of slubs. These slubs are put in intentionally today in order to add texture. They're very popular for drapery and other modern applications. However, slubs in the past were seen as a negative aspect. They were seen as a mistake or a issue with quality. So if you go back to the 19th century, 18th century and further back, you won't find slubby silk being idealized like it is today as a fashionable item. It was something that was generally rejected. The benefits that it has in modern day is that it tends to be cheaper because it can be woven out of less ideal silk. It's sort of second quality in many ways. So you will find that less expensively. And there are plenty of shantungs that really border on being a taffeta that have very, very tiny slubs and are barely noticeable. It's just something to be aware of when you are trying to go with more historically accurate things rather than stylistic choices where modern textiles are perfectly appropriate. You also should be aware of the fact that sometimes dupionis have very, very poor quality, not just in the slubs, but in terms of their weave being very open and unstructured and they can fray out really fast for that reason. So if you can handle the fabric first, that's the best. If not, just make sure that the appearance of the weave is still very finely woven with thin threads rather than huge chunky gaps 
within that fabric. Going even more lumpy, however, we have noal or other sorts of silk suitings. These are very intentionally nubby, beyond just dupiani nubby. They're usually very heavy threads, very textured. They're much more matte. They're not the same shiny silk that we're used to. They are almost soft in their texture, though honestly, I have handled quite a few of those fabrics that are actually a little bit scratchy. And they're sort of made of the leftover bits of silk. Not all of the silk comes out in these beautiful long filaments. Sometimes you end up with shorter staples, and that is a really great way to utilize it. This fabric certainly existed earlier. It's a cheap way to use leftover bits of silk, but it really doesn't take off in fashionable usage until the 20th century. So I generally would avoid it unless you're doing vintage women's suits or something of that nature. It's a really interesting texture of fabric, but it's just honestly kind of difficult to work with and not always going to be the best silk for different applications. Our next topic area is another weave. We've been talking about plain weave fabrics and we're moving on to crepe weaves. Crepes are also plain woven. However, they have special twists done to them in order to get a pebbled texture. So crepes are usually very soft, very delicate in their feel. They can be heavier weight, but they are very drapey. They are not crisp like taffetas, and they often are a little bit more on the matte side rather than shiny. They have those attributes in part due to the way that the threads are spun. When you spin threads, you either spin them to the right or to the left. You end up with an S or a Z twist. And if you use alternating rows of S and Z, when you release the fabric off the loom, it will sort of crinkle up a little bit into a very pebbly, crepey texture. And that's how you technically get a crepe fabric. Now, there are other types of creped fabric which are done by way of embossing. So they actually have heated metal plates that press that pebble texture into the textile. That's something that starts up in the 1820s, and you see both types of creping used throughout the 19th century. It tends to be a more popular textile when it comes to accessories, such as veils or other soft, drapey things that you would need. It is particularly popular when it comes to morning wear in the 19th century because of that matte finish rather than shiny finish, which is what is desirable in terms of morning wear and it really doesn't make its way into entire garments until we reach the beginning of the 20th century and women's clothing becomes much more drapey and fluid and soft. So it starts to become more popular at the beginning of the century and by the time we reach the 1920s and 30s, it is a very, very popular type of fabric when it comes to weave. Now there are many types of fabrics that fall under this umbrella of crepe. First off, we have crepe de chine. This one is fairly lightweight. It is a little bit on the cheaper side when it comes to types of silk, and it is finely woven, but very drapey and thin and lightweight. In fact, I'm wearing crepe de chine right now. And it's something that is wonderful for blouses and can also be very good for linings. Moving up in weight, you have heavier crepe fabrics as well. And you will see those woven with the crepe texture or also called hammered silks where the texture is actually pressed into them. As we find our way into the mid-weight crepes, there are also fabrics that combine the crepe weave along with the satin weave. Satin weave is very simple. It just simply goes over multiple threads and under one. And it essentially puts much more shine on the top side of that textile because you see far more flat, long threads. But it's woven in a way that those little undersections are not visible, they don't create a pattern. So you just end up with this nice watery shine effect on your textile. These can be woven with crepe backs. A great example of this is charmeuse. Charmeuse is a lighter weight crepe back satin and it usually is very flowy. It is fairly opaque. Sometimes it is lightweight enough that you can definitely get light through it very easily, but it is a very flowy fabric. And once again, is more appropriate to the 20th century and onwards. The best example of silk charmeuse tends to come from the 20s, 30s, and 40s, when you have those very elaborately draped and flowing bias cut gowns. Beautiful silk charmeuse application not so much something you're going to see being used in earlier centuries. 
As we move up in weight, you also have regular crepe back satin, which is not technically charmeuse. It's much heavier, and therefore it's going to be a little bit less showy if you want something that has more substance to it, if you want to make sure you don't have to use a lining, or if you don't want to show every single bump underneath that textile. It's a great fabric for that use. It does tend to be more expensive than charmeuse because as you go up in weight, you go up in the amount of fiber that they have packed into each inch, so therefore it becomes more expensive. But crepe back satin, again, is a wonderful fabric to use for the 20th century. If you need satins for earlier than that, there are different types. You have your duchess satin, which is a very stiff satin. And that one can have more of a taffeta back. It can have a bit of a crepey back too, but it is not drapey. It is very stiff. It is very finely woven. And you can find it a little bit towards the lighter weight side, but you can also find it immensely dense and heavy. But that's the satin that you see used historically a lot. When you see entire gowns made out of satin or accessories like cloaks and capes and shoes and things of that nature made out of satin, that's really the appropriate type. It doesn't shift around in the same way. It's not nearly as squirrely. And so it is much, much easier to work with than the different types of crepe back satin are because they tend to be all sorts of wiggles. You can also get duchess satin woven where it's double faced. So you see satin on both sides. Now with both types of duchess satin, I find it terribly interesting in the fact that the way that it's woven with so many weft threads on top, you can actually have a different colored back than front. So you can have your warp threads and your weft threads be different colors, just like that iridescent taffeta. But what you will get instead is actually seeing two different colors entirely on the two different sides. This also can work for the double face silk satin where it can be single colored or it can be woven with two different colors. It does of course get more expensive the more silk you put in. So satin duchess is very expensive and double faced is even more so. Now that we've worked our way through the heavier fabrics, Let's jump all the way down to the lightweight fabrics, starting with China silk. China silk is usually very stiff in comparison to many of the other lightweight fabrics, but it is still fairly opaque. It is inexpensive and is actually very good as a textile for lining more modern garments. It's also regularly termed habitoy. Then we have our silks that are even more sheer. We have things like gauze, chiffon, and georgette. And I know it can sometimes be difficult to know what the differences are between those, but they are both technical and visual. So silk gauze specifically is woven with what is called a leno weave. And the leno weave is a little bit different than plain weave in the fact that the warp threads, as they're running down, actually twist over each other. So as you send a weft thread back and forth, the warp threads will go over under, but then they will cross over each other and then go over under and repeat that. So it's a more complex weave, but it ends up with a very strong and sturdy fabric that can be very open weave. And in fact, you will sometimes see this weave being used in decorative areas to create a very checkerboard appearance with open sections. What this does on the lighter weight gauze, however, is create a bit of a texture to it. It's not the same pebble texture as a crepe, but it has more of a striated vertical texture to it. It's not straight long stripes, but you sort of see little etches along the whole fabric. And so it's very lightweight. It can be a little bit crisper than chiffon sometimes, but again, that comes down more so to finishing process than it does to necessarily how this is woven or the size of the threads. Because both gauze and chiffon use very, very fine threads. Gauze can just be a little bit more open weave or possibly use a little bit finer of thread. When it comes to chiffon, sometimes it's a little bit heavier thread, sometimes it's a little bit more heavily packed, but it is also using that crepe style of weaving that we talked about earlier. So it very often will have a little bit of a pebbly texture to it. I have seen smooth crepes that are just completely plain weave and don't have any pebble texture to them as well. I have not been able to discern why they define both of these as chiffon when you go online to purchase them, nor have I been able to find exactly what historical terms those might have originated as because 
Chiffons have been around for a very long time in Asia and were really only popularly picked up in the European market more in the 19th century. So you start to see them used as overlays, but again, like many very drapey textiles, they really take off in the 20th century. The difference between chiffon and georgette is just the matter of how thick those threads are. So you end up with two or three ply threads rather than a single ply thread. This means that it makes it more dense and more opaque. So chiffon is much easier for you to visibly see through than georgette is. Again, georgette, a little bit of a later textile when it comes to popular usage in Western clothing. There is also silk organza in terms of sheer textiles. The main difference with silk organza is that though it has a similar plain weave to say silk chiffon and it has a similar opacity and similar overall weight and thread size, it's very, very crisp and very, very stiff. And this is really one of your ideal textiles for trims and accessories throughout a good deal of history. This is something that will hold shape and hold pleats very well, and it feels almost like it's been starched heavily. This is another great example of a fabric that you do not want to wash. You can sometimes get away with washing crepe silks because they're more loose and drapey. I would not wash a silk organza. <laughs> Silk organzas are not always plain weave. They can be satin faced, so they are woven with one side having a satin finish, but they are still semi sheer. Tends to give them a little bit more opaqueness when they are satin weave. There are other great textiles for broad historic usages, however. A good example of that is a corded or ribbed silk. We also term this fail, file, fai. I've heard all three from lots of different people and I don't necessarily think there's a right way to say this particular term. So we're just going to refer to it as a corded silk. And this is done with a plain weave, but by using a heavier thread on either the weft or the warp. So you can have the cords running one way or the other. And it essentially just creates a ribbed texture along the silk. And this can be very fine or very chunky. So you'll see both ends of the spectrum. Usually the silk threads that you visibly see are still very finely spun and not thick or chunky, but that heavier thread could actually be a cotton or a blend. This is again a great textile for many applications and you see it regularly used on all sorts of garments throughout hundreds and hundreds of years. It is something that is very often more expensive today, but occasionally you will find some versions of that which are sold for about the same price as taffeta. Extending this particular silk, there is a finishing process that can be done to it that turns it into a watered silk or a silk moiré. And this particular type of silk has a pattern on it which looks very much like water running back and forth, almost like a wood grain effect to the textile. Historically, this was done by way of folding the silk in half and wetting it down and running it through presses in order to create these water-based designs. Today, we actually imprint the design directly onto the textile, so it tends to be on the full width of the fabric, and it tends to be very repetitive rather than a natural form shape that occurs. You also tend to see it way more often in polyester than silk. So it's really, really hard to find a true watered silk today. Moving into the more complex weaves, we're going to start with silk jacquard. Silk jacquard is defined specifically as a complex weave where you have a design woven throughout, very repetitive. It can be very small or a little bit larger. And we call them jacquards because of the jacquard loom that was invented in the late 18th century. It didn't allow us to do these fabrics. They were already being done but it did automate it and so it made it very fast and therefore much cheaper to make these very complexly woven textiles. They are very often single color though you can see multiple colors used. The key to this tends to be just the difference in texture and weave so you might alternate the type of weave that you have in order to make a small design pop as you work along the textile. These can be on the more stiff side and they can also be on the more drapey side. So if you say look up modern silk jacquards, you will very often find a very loose, lightweight silk jacquard. This is really great for, again, 20th 
20th century applications, but the silk jacquards that you find in the 19th century and back tend to be a little bit more on the stiff side. There are still plenty of examples like that. They just might not always be called silk jacquards because they have a texture very often closer to a taffeta weave. So this is something to be aware of that there is going to be a broad range of weights and textures when it comes to silk jacquards. From there, we can move on into slightly more complex weaves of damasks. Damasks are woven to give a very busy pattern across the entire textile that is usually very symmetrical. So you end up with a very repeated design across the whole textile working back and forth. Very often they are greatly inspired by natural forms. However, they have been so artistically done over that they may no longer resemble actual flowers and vines and leaves, but that is where a lot of those designs really got started in terms of their inspirations. Damasks are incredibly popular in some of the earlier time periods, 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries. However, the exact design styles do change over those years, and that is a whole complex thing I won't get into. That would be a whole video unto itself. But they are very much defined by that repetitive pattern that can be single color or two-tone and very often relies on different weave types in order to make those designs pop out. If you want to get into multiple colors, that's where we're getting into our silk brocades. You can also find things called silk lazares that are in the same family range. And these usually use multiple colors to create a very almost painterly effect on the textile. You can have very small designs like little flowers spaced pretty far apart on your textile. You can have very densely woven multiple tones all sorts of crazy designs crammed into a small space. And depending on how it's woven and how closely the designs are woven, you will see a different type of brocade as you look at the back. So the front face may be beautiful, but the back side may have some issues. And I don't mean that it's defective. I mean, in the sense that modern brocades tend to be woven where they will weave the threads that they need to. And if it's not needed, it gets carried along across. So if you have a widely spaced out design, you'll end up with all of these long threads across the back that haven't been tacked down to anything. And this is something you need to be intensely aware of if you are planning on making a garment that does not have a lining or facing to it. This is something that will catch, pull, and create a problem. You can find modern brocades, and you certainly found historical brocades that did not have this issue, where they instead wove those back threads in in a way that was invisible on the front. You can also find brocades that are woven in such a detailed manner that both the front and the back are functional sides, which was something that was highly prized throughout history because it's something that you don't need to line or face in any way. So it makes for a very beautiful and very highly skilled and expensive textile if that is the case. Another finely skilled textile to weave is that of silk ikat. It is woven with these beautiful, very feathery designs, and you will find textures that are more taffeta-like, some that have a little bit more of a satin finish, some that are a little bit more looser, softer weave to them, and they are considered special because of the designs that make them up. Instead of being printed onto the fabric or being woven in as they go by using different colors of weft threads, the warp threads are dyed with that design before they are actually woven up. So that's how you end up with a slightly offset feathery design. You're not going to be able to keep your warp threads perfectly aligned, and it is something that was intensely popular throughout many different time periods in history and is still being produced in some of the same places that it used to be. And there is a whole specific wonderful history to silk ikat and the designs that are woven in and the symbolism that those represent. Historically, you're more likely going to find floral ikats being used in the Western world instead of some of those more meaningful designs. For some other fun silk fabrics, we have things like silk tulle, which is a net silk that is woven in a way that has a lot of big open spaces. It's also the same sort of netting that is used in many laces. So you can have very soft versions of this and you can have very stiff versions of this. It can vary pretty widely in terms of that level of texture, but they are usually very expensive and fairly difficult to find today. We also have silk velvet. 
And there are two very different types of silk velvet that you are likely to come across in modern day. One of which is the more typical one. When you just search silk velvet, you get a silk and rayon velvet. It is very drapey. It is very loose and very lightweight. It is actually a silk woven back and a rayon face, meaning that the actual plush part is rayon. It still has a very silky sheen to it. Rayon was of course created to replace silk as a synthetic. So it will still give you a very silky silk-like sheen, but they are almost never actually silk-faced. So that sort of texture, again, much more appropriate for the 20th century. You don't usually find silk velvets that drapey earlier than that. What you find instead are these silk velvets that are woven very often with a cotton backing and a silk face. And this is much stiffer, much sturdier, much more structural and very heavy in comparison. It's a lot closer in weight to our modern cotton velveteens than it is to what we usually find as silk velvet. And it's very difficult to find and it's very expensive. So it's not always the easiest choice. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of times I will choose to use a cotton velveteen or a rayon based heavy cotton backed velvet instead of going with a true heavy historical silk velvet. But the key here is that those are two very different types of silk velvets and the actual length of the pile historically does vary as well. So you will not only find fairly short velvets, much like the cotton velveteen, but you will also find longer silk plushes, which you can think of as a little bit closer to antique teddy bear fur. We're also going to make a quick reference to silk jersey. Again, something that is more commonly used in the 20th century, but you can find silk knits much further back. Obviously, silk knit stockings go very far back and really took off at the end of the 16th century in Queen Elizabeth's time when the knitting machine was invented and stockings could be knit very, very quickly and very, very finely. So you will find a lot of silk knit stockings and silk knit fabrics throughout those different centuries. They're still sort of figuring out how best to use it and knits and jersey as a main clothing item really don't take off until later in the 19th century with undergarments and then eventually make their way into actual clothing wear in the 20th century. There are such things as 18th century men's knit breeches, but they're not a common item in comparison to flat woven textiles without stretch. The final type of silk that I want to quickly mention is that of art silk, which is in fact rayon. So you'll find many textiles and trims that use that term and it just simply means that they have a silky texture to them. It doesn't mean that they are actually silk in any way, shape, or form, since they do not come from the silkworm. It doesn't mean that they are poor quality, and in fact, there is a good amount of time in the early 20th century where rayon comes in and silk is still being regularly used, and the quality of the rayon is so high that I still have a hard time discerning whether some things are rayon or silk. Rayon can do such a good job of being a fake silk that it really is a textile that should be heavily considered if you are on a budget or need something very specific that you just can't find in that natural fiber. I personally love rayon and use it in a lot of my clothing items because it is something that is relatively breathable, unlike actual silk. Actual silk is very stifling. It does not breathe. It does not let you perspire through it very easily. It doesn't deal with water very well. And it's great for keeping you warm, especially if it's like lining in a winter coat, but it is not good for summer wear and it is not terribly breathable. So there are definitely times where rayon as a replacement for silk is a very logical choice, not only for budget, but for function as well. I hope to be able to talk about rayon more in the future along with other man-made fibers, but that's my two cents when it comes to silk substitutes. I personally generally avoid polyester silk substitutes whenever possible, just because I find they don't breathe any better than silk does, and that a lot of times they tend to be fiddlier to work with. That being said, they usually are much cheaper, so there are definitely times where that is also the better option. So it's something that is up to you. There are so many choices out there when it comes to places to buy your textiles. I'm not getting into that. Again, that would be hours and hours of video time just going through all of these different places. But use these terms, go search for them. Find the different sites that carry these 
types of silks with those terminologies and hopefully this will make you a better educated shopper and a better educated historian and a better educated artist as well because we are all making wonderful wonderful things but if we don't have a good knowledge of our tools and our supplies they can often fight back and in the end we will very rarely realize that it's not our fault that we're having a hard time and in fact it is the textile's fault. So it's really important to choose the right textile for the right job so that way you have the best chance of success for your garment coming out the way that you want it to look and feel and move and function and live. Because like I said, silk isn't always washable. So it may not always be the right choice, even if it's something you can afford, even if it is the most beautiful thing, it will always come down to what you need for that specific garment and whether or not that fabric is the best function for you.